Good evening. Uh, thank you for having me here, Jerry. Always a pleasure to come to the aquarium. Uh, I'm going to share with you a lecture that I actually put together for an initiative from the uh, University of California led by my good friend Rama at the UCSD. It's called Bending the Curve. Uh, it's the UC as a whole coming with recommendations uh, to bend our curve of greenhouse gases emission in California, in the state of California. You know, this state is well ahead of a lot of the other states. Uh, <clears throat> proposing uh, some engineering solutions to that. And he asked me to do a lecture on uh, ice sheet and sea level. So I'm going to use that material for tonight. And um, <clears throat> it has learning objectives. <laughs> Describe how melting occurs, uh, the history of melting, and then the third one is uh, to show the impact on society uh, to curb these events. You'll see that a lot of what I'm going to show tonight doesn't look like very good news. Um, but we are also looking at, at things in the, in the climate system that, that could be encouraging, encouraging us that we're not running too much out of time, but there's still a lot of things that we could do on time. So we're looking at the, the worst case scenarios, but we're also looking at ways we could, uh, we could curb some of that signal. So um, <clears throat> the first one is to talk about the melting, how melting happens uh, uh, on the ice sheet. So we have Greenland, we have Antarctica that's locking up most of the fresh water on Earth. If we were to melt all of the ice on, Antarctic, uh, on Greenland, we would raise sea level by seven meters. I'm not going to translate in feet here. I'm not using the metric system. I hope you don't mind. <coughs> um, in terms precip of precipitation, and, and, and Antarctica, 56 meters, right? Global. Uh, we would be underwater, definitely, uh, over here if this was happening. In terms of precipitation, uh, 24 centimeters per year in Greenland, 17 in Antarctica. They are deserts by world standards. The average precipitation rate on the, wor uh, on the world scale is one meter per year. We don't get one meter per year in Southern California. We live in a desert. I remind my kids every day, but they still take long showers. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Some numbers, for those of you who like a little bit calculus, one millimeter sea level rise, that's 360 gigatons of land ice taken from the land and thrown into the ocean. 360 gigaton. One gigaton, 10 to the power 9 tons, 10 to the power 12, 1 trillion kilos. Uh, to put things in perspective, I always use that. Uh, the city of Los Angeles is using 1 gigaton of water annually for its consumption of water. Right? So 1 millimeter sea level rise, that's 360 times the cost emission of water by LA. Uh, a lot of what I'll talk about is referring to gigaton, so that's one city consumption, like I mean. uh, <clears throat> You saw from a bill that sea level is rising three, millimeter, three millimeters per year, 30 centimeters per century. I'll show you that uh, we're probably going to, uh, we are on a trend of one meter sea level rise per century right now. Uh, as a glaciologist, I'm not so worried about one meter sea level rise per century. I'm worried about the possibility of going to four meters sea level rise per century. And it happened before. It happened 12,000 years ago. Uh, there was a period of time where sea level rose that much faster. And to put that in perspective, if the glaciers flowing uh, around the Antarctic, uh, which are dispersing ice from the land into the ocean, were to speed up by a factor 6.5, we would raise sea level by four meters century. 6.5 the glacier speed. And I'll show you that some of these glaciers are, are doing that already. So some terminology in, in Antarctica where it's cold, you have soil accumulation densifying into ice. If ice is thick enough, it deforms under its own weight. It flows. It forms floating extension when it's on the ocean. They're called ice shelves. These ice shelves melt in contact with the ocean and they break up into icebergs. Same thing in Greenland, but we don't have ice shelves in Greenland except in the north because it's too warm, so the ice shelf disintegrate. So instead, we have the ice reaching the ocean and melting in contact with the ocean and forming icebergs. 
And the ingredient on top of that, we have the melting of the ice from the surface because it's warm enough to melt the surface and produce runoff. In Antarctica, it's too cold. There's melt in Antarctica, but it's not enough melt to produce runoff, meaning water that runs down the hill and reaches the ocean. So runoff in Antarctica right now, zero. You would need to warm up Antarctica by another three or four degrees to get a lot of runoff. Uh, in Greenland, runoff and the discharge are about the same number. Uh, <clears throat> yes. This is uh, ice and snow melt in Greenland. It forms these uh, supraglacial lakes and rivers that flow along the surface of the ice sheet. And then eventually, they form these rivers that drop down to a big hole called the Moulin. Right? These rivers don't reach the ocean. We don't go all the way to the Moulin here, because the video cameraman got a little bit worried about that. But <laughs> they go down several hundred meters. Then they go laterally, and then they go down again. They make their way all the way to the bed. Some people explore them. Um, there's like a record of going 300 meters below the surface. And, but nobody has been able to go all the way down to the bed. Plus, when there's water going down these moulins, you don't want to go there. So everybody is very familiar with this picture of ice melting from the top and producing meltwater, because we can see it. Right? And in Greenland, that's half of the signal. But there's another part of the signal of melting ice sheets, which is more important than this. But we don't see it. Antarctica, uh, white area, right? white continent, visible. And what we're seeing here is the flow of ice measured from satellites using uh, radar interferometry techniques. So the areas that are purple is areas where the ice is flowing fast. You see the little arrows showing these rivers of ice, right? They channelize the ice from all the way inside the interior of, of Antarctica to the coastlines. Uh, you, you, you see those with satellite techniques measuring the flow rate of motion. If you look at a picture from from space of Antarctica, it's just like a, a white continent, nothing happens. So these rivers of ice are extremely important to determine the future of, of the ice sheet because you have snow piling up on the ice sheet and it deforms and flows slowly into the ocean, but you have these channels, right? these rivers that control how fast the ice is transported to the ocean. So if something happens to these rivers, it changes the way the mass is transferred from Antarctica to the ocean. Right? If these rivers flow faster, they're going to send more ice into the ocean, and sea level is going to rise. Uh, oh, I said there was no sound. Maybe you can cut the sound. When they reach the ocean, uh, the glaciers carve into this iceberg. This is an accelerated motion in, in Greenland. These are gigantic icebergs. There's only 30 meters here, but this piece here that's rotating is about 800 meters long. Right. I just have to go back and show you that video again, hopefully. Uh, and for a long time, people assumed that most of the ice discharge from these glaciers into the ocean was proceeding by icebergs. That is until we studied this in a little bit more detail and realized that the ocean underneath plays an equally important role, and maybe an even more important role. Right? And I'll, I'll explain that to you in, 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 in a minute. Another very important thing to know about ice sheets is the process of marine ice sheet instability. Uh, it's a process by which, if you start retreating a part of Greenland or Antarctica, it could start retreating very rapidly. You could actually not be able to stop it. So this um, theory of ice sheet instability was put together by scientists in the 60s and 70s. And back then, they were worried about what was happening in, in West Antarctica. But there was no data to verify whether what they were saying was true or not. And that th these theories felt a little bit in oblivion because there was no data to prove it. And uh, with fancier models, fancier computers, especially in Europe, people started to doubt that theory. What that theory says is if you grow an ice sheet on what we call a reverse slope, right, meaning that this is the edge of the ice sheet, this is the interior, it gets deeper. And this, this can happen in a lot of places because you're piling ice on top of the Earth's crust, so it tends to depress the crust and make 
the depression here. There's only two stable state for that ice sheet. One where it reaches the continental shelf here, and then it, it breaks off. Right? It cannot advance much more because it would have to be so much thicker. And the other stage is if it starts retreating, the next stable state is when the ice is all gone. Right? As the ice retreats and it gets into deeper ground, there are some feedback processes that make the ice deform faster, break up faster, and you cannot stop it. Even if you change the climate, you cannot stop it. It's just basic physics. If you have the ice sheet growing on a normal bed, I don't know why this is reverse, which is normal. I didn't come up, come up with the terminology. Right? Going up, up here like this is a stable uh, configuration. If the ice starts retreating and you change the climate, it will stop and re-advance. Right? So this is OK, the nice guys. These are the dangerous, dangerous uh, ice streams. So what's happening to the Antarctic uh, is driven a lot, and we found that out in the, over the last 20 years, by what's happening to the ocean. So in the Antarctic, remember, there's no melt at the surface. And in fact, the computer models were saying no melt, more evaporation from the ocean, from the warmer ocean, therefore more precipitation in Antarctica. Antarctica is growing. That's what the models say. We haven't seen that at all. There's no growth and increase in precipitation over the Antarctic. Uh, the polar ocean are very different from the rest of the world. In, uh, in the ocean around us, you have warm water at the top and cold water at the bottom. Right? In the polar ocean, it's the opposite. You have cold water at the top. It's cooled by the atmosphere, by the extremely low temperatures. And you have warm water at the bottom, 400, 700 meters below the surface. But well, you can't see that from a boat. You can't see that from an airplane. You can see that from our satellites. The NASA satellites can't measure that. They can measure the temperature at the surface, but not, not very far down. That's why some of this science is difficult to do, because you need to actually lower instrument in the ocean to measure that. Right. Um, if you're a scientist, you would know that warm water should not be happy staying here at depth below cold water. Right? This is less dense, but it's also saltier. So it's happy there, salty and warm. And it's right about the depth of these deep glaciers, which have an ice about the melting point. And ice doesn't like salty water. Right? You know that. We can throw salt on the road to get rid of ice to protect uh, circulation. Right? You get an extra two degrees for free because uh, sea ice melts at minus two degrees C's instead of zero, two, zero degrees C's, right? So if you put salt, automatically you have uh, plenty of heat to melt the ice. So the ice can melt very vigorously in contact with, your, with the polar ocean waters. The heat around the Antarctic is in that current called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. It's a big gyre, right? Antarctica has its own climate. There's no land that, part that blocks that, that thing except over here, that narrow passage, the direct passage. This is stirred around by the westerlies, by these winds that circulate clockwise. And these winds decide what's happening to the ocean. And they decide ocean circulation in particular. So there's two ways you can change the temperature of the ocean. That's important to understand. One is to increase the temperature of the ocean. And Bill talked about that. One is to change ocean circulation, meaning you bring some warm water in places where it didn't used to be or you bring more warm water in some places. So that warm water around the Antarctic, Antarctica lacks it as long as it stays a good thousand kilometers away from it. That's a good distance, right? But the winds have been changing around the Antarctic. They have been increasing. And when they increase, they uh, result in contraction. So that Antarctic circumpolar uh, water s starts coming closer to the Antarctic. Uh, when the circulation increases, it tends to send because of Ekman transport. You know about Ekman transport? Anyone? It's the Coriolis effect. It sends, in the southern hemisphere, it sends the surface water to the north. And that tends to increase the sea ice extent slightly in the Antarctic. And to compensate for that flow of warm water, of cold water to the north, it brings more warm water towards the Antarctic that melts the glaciers. 
It's doing that because Antarctica is not warming as fast as the rest of the world. It's in fact cooling because of the loss of the ozone. It cools the Antarctic, a big, big ozone hole. And there's no albedo feedback in, in Antarctica. It's still white. The sea ice cover hasn't changed very much. Completely the opposite in the Arctic. So Antarctica is not warming up as fast as the world. So the difference in temperature between Antarctica and the rest of the world is getting bigger. And that increases the wind. About 30% increase in wind since the 1980s. So there's more and more warm water coming in contact with the Antarctic continent. In Greenland, it's a little bit more complex. The Arctic is warming up two to three times faster than the rest of the world. So instead of having increasing westerlies, they start wobbling. And they put this craziness in our climate system that brings really cold winters in the eastern part of the US, whereas here in California, we're walking around in bathing suits. Right? It also brings a lot of heat towards Greenland because this wobbling of the jet stream tends to be stationary too and tends to bring more warmth from subtropical regions than usual. And same as the Antarctic in Greenland, the polar waters, uh, the warm waters are at depth and they eat the glaciers from below. And we only discovered that once we started looking below the surface into what was happening in the glaciers and find big cavities underneath. Right? Uh, you can still read books, glaciology books, that would tell you when glaciers reach the ocean, they break into icebergs, period. Right? Well, actually, half of the ice is melting in contact with the ocean. And if the ocean gets warmer, then that triggers uh, changes in, uh, in the ice sheets. Module two, we're doing good. <laughs> How do we measure this? Uh, there are different ways to measure the mass, what we call the mass balance of an ice sheet, how much it's losing mass with time or not. One of the most popular one is using the GRACE gravity mission because it's the most direct way to measure it. It's almost like putting those ice sheets on a scale and looking at the scale change with time. Right? Uh, the type of work I, I do, uh, we measure the outflow of the glaciers and we compare with what's accumulated in, inside, which is a little bit difficult because you're comparing two big numbers. With the GRACE gravity mission, we look at the change in the gravity field over Greenland and Antarctica, and that change in the gravity field is related to changes in mass at the surface of the Earth. Right? What's below there doesn't change much. It changes at the surface. You can make a movie. It's like the Weather Channel. Right? And it started in 2002. But our record actually goes back to the 1970s, the first measurements by satellite where we can measure speed in Greenland and Antarctica. But I'm not showing that tonight. This is pretty cool because you get monthly measurements. And in Greenland, you can see the up and downs with summer and winter, right? Accumulation of mass during the winter and then a drop in mass in summer, accumulation of mass and drop, right? A little bit like the sea level curve that Bill was showing. And you see that that mass is going down with time, about 270 gigatons per year, right? That's about, it's not a millimeter, but it's getting close. And you see that that, that curve here is not a straight line. It has a little bit of a bent in it because that mass loss is increasing every year. This is the Antarctic. The slope is not as big. And you see a lot more jagged signal. Well, it's seven times the size of Greenland. Uh, it's dominated by natural variability in precipitation. But you see clearly the curve of Antarctic losing mass with time, and it's in fact accelerating faster than Greenland. And with GRACE, we can all do, some, do something that only GRACE has been able to do. This is a curve representing all the mountain glaciers and ice cap in the world. There are hundreds of thousands of glaciers that people have struggled to monitor on the ground, but you, you can't. It's impossible to do that. And these glaciers also contribute to sea rise, almost equal to Greenland, but the ice sheets are already ahead. I know I have a lot of dispute with my colleagues studying mountain glaciers. You can't say that. Oh, yeah, well, uh, I'm not saying that. The data show that. I mean, so I'm sorry. The ice sheets are already ahead of the glaciers and ice caps. But these guys are counting, too. They add up to the balance, right? And you see also a little bit of curvature, uh, the increase in mass loss of the glaciers. Now, if we take all these numbers together, 
there's the average mass loss, and then there's the increase in mass loss. Right? That increase here is about 44 gigaton per year every year. Every year, we had a mass loss of 44 gigatons. If you take that and project it to the end of the century, that's one meter of sea level rise for melting ice sheets. Uh, you could argue, well, it could go less than that. It could go faster than that. I'm not going to argue with you. I'm saying if we continue the same trend, we get a meter by 2100. And most likely, if you ask me, we're going to get more than that. But one meter is not science fiction. This is the rate at which it's evolving right now. I talked to you about marine ice sheet instability. This was a little bit of a game changer in 2002 when we saw these ice shelves, the floating extension of Lassen B break up. We saw it also in Lassen A, but not enough people were paying attention in 1995. In 2002, we had a little bit thicker glasses to look at that. And the question was, what are the glaciers going to do? The ones that are upstream that are blocked by this ice shelf from runaway into the ocean. What are we going to do? And some people said, they're not going to do nothing, man. And some people said, they well, might speed up. Well, we had some data to look at that. Well, indeed, they sped up. They sped up by a factor three to eight, right? Sometimes I say it's like changing the speed limit on the freeway from 55 miles per hour to, what, 400 miles per hour. Right? Yes, they did change. And we are now 15 years later, and these glaciers are still flowing at three to four times the speed that they had prior. Right? So this was an example of, of instability. You break this ice shelf, which would take centuries to recreate. If you just let the ice flow back into the ocean and reform that ice shelf, it would take centuries to recreate. And these glaciers up there started to speed up by three to eight. They're tiny. They don't hold a lot of ice. It's like a millimeter sea level rise contained in this area. But if the same thing happens farther south, where you have big drainage, that's not good news. And I'm going to talk uh, to you about some areas like this in Greenland. So this is a map of the bed in Greenland. So everywhere we see this blue color, uh, the base of the ice sheet is below sea level. That means it's very easy if the ice retreats for the ocean to follow through. When the ice sheet is gone, you have an ocean here. Right? You have an ocean here. This is West Antarctica. You'll have just an archipelago here, a few islands. So that all of that will be underwater. So in Greenland, we have three basins that are submarine and that are controlled by one and two, three, four, five glaciers. Okay. This one, Jakob Seven, the biggest glacier in Greenland, holds 0 0.6 meter sea level rise. Peterman and Humboldt hold another 0 0.6. And the north east side stream here holds 1.1 meter sea level rise. That glacier drains all the way to the, to the center part of Greenland. I'm going to show you data that suggests that this floodgate already opened up. This one is starting to open, and this one has doors flapping. Right? This is 2017. Antarctica has a lot of floodgates. There's enough. Three. It has many. I didn't count them all. I get a little bit scared when I do that. Yeah. I'm going to talk to you about two tonight, because that will be enough for you to get some sleep. <laughs> the Amundsen Sea sector uh, of West Antarctica, which you will hear more and more with time, which has the Pine Island, Twaits, and other glaciers, some very deep basin here, map in the 60s, which are more than three kilometers below sea level. I mean, they're so deep that the first people who were in the measurement there they spent a year redoing the measurement to convince themselves they were reading their instruments right, right? And they had no support. They couldn't call home. They couldn't check on the internet or go through Wikipedia to figure out they were right. right? So this one holds 1.2 meters sea level rise equivalent. And uh, in 2000, several years ago, we said that this floodgate had been open already. And I'm going to talk about another glacier here, the Totem Glacier. One glacier in East Antarctica, that's the plateau, it's a little bit higher up, but it also has marine-based sectors, right? 3.9 meters from that one glacier in the Antarctic. Big monsters, right? This is about 100 kilometers wide, right? This glacier is about 30 kilometers wide. This is like the size of Los Angeles, right? 
So um, Jakob Saren, that's the first one over here. Uh, one of my Danish students told me recently, actually, that's not how you say it in Danish. It's said Jakob Karen. I was like, I've been working on this glacier for 25 years, and you're only telling me now. <laughs> he went back to Denmark. I sent him back. <laughs> that glacier flows down a deep Grand Canyon. It's actually as deep as the Grand Canyon. And that canyon goes very far inland, hundreds of kilometers. Uh, we map the bed in great detail uh, with NASA mission. So we, we know exactly how it shapes up and how it gets deeper inland and it stays very deep. That glacier had started retreating from the Little Ice Age, where this was the front in the li Little Ice Age, at the beginning of when Bill was born in 1902. Hey, Bill. <laughs> it was over here. It took 50 years all the youth of Bill uh, <laughs> to retreat this much, and over 50 years to retreat to 2001, and this was done in just five years. Right? Uh, there was a floating extension in front of uh, Jakob Savon and Ice Shelf that broke off in 2002. The glacier sped up by a factor three, is retreating about half a kilometer per year. Uh, in 2012, a very high melt year it reached a phenomenal speed of 18 kilometers per year, the fastest glacier on the face of Earth. All right. That glacier holds a 0 0.6 meter sea level rise. And from the data that we have, it will retreat fast for another several decades. We can't stop it. Right. Uh, the northeast ice stream, uh, the corner of Greenland here, has also a floating ice shelf that started breaking up in 2004, but it took a little longer for the glacier to react. This was, this is a cross, this is along the glacier here. This is the thickness of the ice. This is the floating extension. This is the water. This was what it looked like in 99, 2010, and 2014. Now it's retreating down uh, uh, this slope. Right? This is a reverse slope. And it stays flat for a little while. And then it's going to have to climb up that hill, which is going to stabilize it for a little while. But that glacier is also retreating at half a kilometer per year in northeast Greenland. We are on the far northeast corner of Greenland. That's the coldest part of Greenland. And the glaciers are changing rapidly here, too. Peterman Glacier, that's the third one, at a very stable ice front since first uh, visited by a human eye in, in 1910. The ice front was about here, and it stayed like that for a long time until 2010, where a big piece of ice started to break off. Uh, you can see these measurements from NASA airborne platforms, the thickness in 2002, 2007, and 2010. Right? This is 400 meters of ice. It's gone. Right? This is the floating part of the glacier. It's in contact with the ocean, and it's starting to break up because the ocean waters are getting warmer around Greenland and break up that ice storm. Now that glacier hasn't changed its speed very much yet, but it lost 35% of its floating extension. So these are the three big marine-based glaciers of, of, of Greenland. And then we have Antarctica. This is the West Antarctic sector with the Pine Island, Twaits, and the Smith. This glacier is Pope, Smith, Kohler. This is the flow speed that you see. And then in red, you will, uh, after you see the colors indicating the flow motion, you will see areas where it's speeding up. The redder, the more speed up. All of these glaciers are speeding up at the same time. They're responding to a common forcing. These glaciers are retreating a very, along a very deep trough, more than two kilometers below sea level. This is the floating ice in light blue. This is the grounding line where the uh, ice meets the ocean. We remove the ice shelf. That glacier retreated 35 kilometers in 15 years, the fastest retreat of any glacier on the face of Earth in West Antarctica, where you don't have a peck of surface melt. But there's a lot of things happening in the ocean, driven by the wind. And that whole sector here is a, a, a submarine basin with a reverse slope uh, that is undergoing uh, an irreversible retreat. 
like my movie. And then the totem in East Antarctica, right, that catchment here contains a 3.9 meter sea level rise equivalent. That glacier is losing mass with time. And in 2015, my Australian colleagues got a boat there for the first time ever. And somebody dropped a probe in front of that glacier and they found warm water right in front of the glacier coming from the circumpolar deep current, able to come in through that hole and flood the glacier and eat it from below. Uh, <clears throat> we have some good news uh, on this glacier is that right upstream of the grounding line is a normal slope. The glacier will have to climb up that slope for 50 kilometers before it starts hitting the very deep basin. So we're probably okay for a little while uh, more with Totem. Model three, what can we do? Well, something about sea level, and Bill talked about that already. We're going for one meter per century. One meter doesn't sound like much, but one meter is actually a lot in terms of the potential damage to our coastlines in terms of all the wealth along the coastlines of our country and how they're going to be affected by sea level. Uh, Bill mentioned the harbor of LA. My, my favorite one is San Francisco. The airport is within a meter of sea level. Right? With one meter sea level, San Francisco doesn't have Oakland Airport, doesn't have SFO. It's underwater. I don't think they know that, or if they don't want to hear, maybe. Right? If you want to build a new airport, that's $40 billion, at least. If you want to protect San Francisco Airport, you can't probably for a little while. Until, until when? I don't know. Uh, the irony also of melting ice sheets is that they raise sea level faster away from them than closer to them. In fact, if you live in Greenland right now, it's a good time to buy beach property. <laughs> because sea level is going to be lower in Greenland in the future. As you remove ice from the land and dump into the ocean, the land rebounds, right? It rises up and sea level is lowering. That's what you see along the edges of the ice sheets. And you know, the land rising here is compensated by something depressed somewhere else, right in the middle. That's where we are. Right? So the red here means areas where sea level is going to rise 30% faster as a result of the crustal deformation than on average around the world. So we are far from the ice sheet. Sometimes people ask me in the past, why do you study ice sheets in California? They are not. Well, because the problem in California is going to be way worse than if I was living in Greenland. Uh, we have other problems in Greenland. And in Antarctica, we don't have any problems. Nobody is there. But these regions are far from us where they're relevant, completely relevant to what's going to happen and what's happening to our coastline. There's another study that's very important coming from the paleoclimate record. This is just one of them, but it's confirmed by a lot of the studies. They went back to a period in the past where the Earth was almost as warm as today, maybe within half a degree, no more. Right? The interglacial is 125,000 years ago, and they know that sea level was six to nine meters higher back then. CO2 levels, however, were much lower than they are now. So CO2 is a different story. But in terms of temperature, that paleo record says if we go to one to two degrees above pre-industrial, and for sure we are going there as fast as we can, we are committing the system to six to nine meters sea level rise. I can see where six to nine meters sea level rise. I know where they would come from. I, it's no surprise to me because I've been thinking about that for 25 years. You've heard about the Paris Accord, right? 1.5. Instead of limiting climate warming to 2 degrees, we're going to limit it to 1.5 degrees. Um, I always had mixed feelings about that. Uh, the one good thing is at least 190 countries or so decided to sit at the table and agree on something on climate change, which is amazing, fantastic. And it's all on a voluntary basis. Everybody is doing as much as they can on a voluntary basis. There's no common tax, right? And everybody is accountable. What you contribute to the system is documented. It's not doing, you're not doing anything in high dark. 
they didn't go for two degrees? I know why, because two degrees, all the models indicate that a bunch of the Pacific Islands are gone. So I thought, that's not fair. <laughs> Let's have a little bit of mercy on these guys and give them a chance. We're going to limit to 1.5 degrees. There's nothing magic about 1.5 degrees. I don't like 1.5 degrees. I think we're fooling ourselves to think that we're going to be OK with 1.5 degree above pre-industrial. In terms of the ice sheet, these floodgates will not stop spilling ice into the ocean with a 1.5 degree above pre-industrial. Right? We're almost there already now. The Amundsen Sea is not going to be stopping its retreat because we stopped the climate warming at 1.5 degrees. We might save Totem, which is a good thing. There are some good news, though. Right? And I'll give you one, because there are not too many. Uh, we've looked at the Western Antarctic ice sheet for long enough, especially the sector of Pine Island Glacier. And we've, now we have measurements done in front of the glaciers in the ocean to see what's happening in the ocean. And there was a period of colder ocean waters in 2012-2013. And what a surprise, during those cold years, all of the glaciers in that sector slowed down their retreat. All right, it's going to go back again, right? But for the first time, it showed us if there's some period of times where we can somehow bring the ocean to colder temperature, we can actually slow down the system maybe to a stop. How do we do that? Well, how do we do that? We have to bring the climate back to where it was before, right? So 1.5 degree, that's, that's good. We can get there with new technologies, but that's not going to be enough. As a glaciologist, I'm saying we need to go back. We need to uh, <clears throat> pay the price for all the carbon that we put in the atmosphere. We have to do carbon sequestration. We have to find some technology. Well, the technologies exist. They're just too expensive. But we have to convince ourselves that moving to a carbon-free economy is one first step, very important step. But we'll have to do something more than that. Yeah? What was the anomaly that caused that? Uh, natural that variability. Okay. Yeah, natural variability. OK, just to Yeah. What can we do? There's a lot of good news. I'm not talking about that. This is my pitch from outside glaciology. But the technology to transition to carbon-free e economy exists, is available. We don't have to invent anything. And it's being developing very rapidly. The question is, how long does it take to replace the oil industry, a $14 trillion business, into something that is not burning oil? Right? It's, you can't do that overnight. It takes several decades to do that. In the meantime, the planet will keep warming. The transition will have to be done most rapidly to avoid the worst effect in the polar regions. We're going to have to do the best we can. And we're going to have to think about ways, at the same time, to sequester carbon from the atmosphere back into deeper ground. And there's a sense of morality that needs to develop and so in doing this. We're not going to do this alone. Right? And Countries like ours, which have the technology and the knowledge, can afford to do that. But there's a lot of other countries who don't have the technology. And we have to give it to them. So I don't know if uh, many of you have seen the new Al Gore movie uh, about the negotiation of the Paris Accord. But at one point, India didn't want to sign in with the Accords. They were like, it's easy for you guys to say, stop burning fossil fuel. You've been using that for 150 years. We'd like to do that too. So if you want us to stop, give us the technology to do something else. So behind doors, we made an agreement between American industry and the Indian government. We're going to transfer a bunch of technology to you guys if you sign for the, the agreement. And they said, OK, we've got a deal. With India on board, that was a game changer uh, for uh, the Paris Accord. But I think it's important to keep this in mind. This has to be a worldwide effort. Uh, I also, uh, when I talk to my students at UCI, when I talk to them about Elon Musk and the transition to uh, electric vehicles, right? that's great what Elon Musk and Tesla is doing. But we need 100 of them to change the billion cars we have around the planet. Right? So all of this is feasible. It's 
a scalability problem to change that on the world, worldwide level. And it's also a timing issue, right? If you can do it fast, that's good. If you take a long time to do it, well, you're just piling up the problems down the line. Uh, and I think that's it. The rest is just going through the learning outcomes, but you're all teachers, you know that stuff better than anything. <laughs>